Uh, we got a great guest tonight. Uh, do you want to roll with a, a yeah. video with them? Yes, we do. And guys. then we'll then we'll get into uh, a discussion with them right after. Yeah, this is a uh, about the foundation video, which is we're going to be getting into, guys. So we're playing it now. Hello, my name is Dwight Mitchell from Family Preservation Foundation. If you are the target of a CPS investigation, it might be worth your time to consider viewing our free legal child protection services video library to understand your legal issues and rights through self-education before hiring an experienced CPS defense attorney. The Family Preservation Foundation works with you to make sure you understand the allegations against you. We will explain the entire CPS process, your options within the process, along with the pros and cons of each option. Depending on the facts of your case and the situation, we will offer you our opinions on some of the possible outcomes of your case. In some instances, we may recommend for you to have your certain discussions with your attorney for a backup plan or a safety net if we feel there is a possibility of your case ending poorly. Ultimately, these decisions are between you and your attorney. Our goal is to ensure you have a complete understanding of the process and that your civil rights are being protected. Our video library will be updated on a regular basis on our website, familypreservationfoundation.org. If you see something you thought was helpful or interesting, we encourage you to share the video with your social network and subscribe to our CPS YouTube video channel so you will be notified when a new video is posted. Thank you very much and have a great day. All right, everybody. So this is absolutely a non-party issue. I think this is something that we can all agree with 100%. Throughout the show, our moderators are going to be putting a link so that we can get the petition signed because you know, just like everything, we need 100,000 signatures on this petition. So um, if you guys could do us a favor, until we get this 100,000, um, go sign the signature like you would any petition, government petition, and then start putting this out on Twitter, Facebook, and let's break their algorithm so that we can get this out there and get the signatures so that we can get this all started. So, Steve, you want to introduce our guest? Yeah, we got a great guest tonight. Uh, his name's... Dwight Mitchell, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, I was uh, excited when um, our show on Friday, your name got mentioned in the pre-show, and then during the show, and after doing some research, uh, learning what you are all about, I was excited to get you on the show right away. And um, you... Uh, have a foundation, but before we get into your foundation, can you tell us a little bit about your history and what got you to where you are now? Well, uh, it's it's interesting. I, uh, for, for a living, I'm a management consultant. So what I what I do is I, I travel around the world and I do uh, management consultant. It's called business process reengineering. And uh, I happen to be working in Minnesota for uh, CHS, it's one of the 60th largest organizations uh, in, in the world. And we were doing a, a multi-site, multi-country implementation. So on these long implementations, I, I bring my family with me. <clears throat> and so uh, it might have been the move, the transition, the change of schools, but my, my middle son was just acting out. He uh, wasn't doing his homework. The teacher was calling, uh, getting up in the morning, uh, playing video games at four in the morning, just just literally being, um, I don't know, a, a rebellious child. Yes. So uh, after you know, talking time out, uh, taking away the Xbox and, you know, all of his toys and things of that nature, nothing seemed to be working. Um, I decided to, you know, do what uh, I think most parents do as, as, a, as a last resort. Uh, and I just gave him an ordinary bonus banking. Um, Unbeknownst to me, in Minnesota, that's illegal. So when I say illegal, uh, you are not allowed to uh, do anything to your child 
that will leave a mark. So, and when I say leave a mark, that's their their level of abuse. Anything that leaves a mark. So, uh, you know, after the spanking, uh, his uh, his mother and I were, were no longer together. His mother told him that uh, if your father ever gives you a spanking, uh, you know, to call the police. Now he was ten years old at the time, and so uh, he he did that. And the next thing I know, uh, CPS is in our lives, r- removing my children. Uh, and I'm like, for a bottom spanking? So, so that's how it all got started. Um, now, whether you believe in um, uh, physical discipline, corporal punishment, bottom spanking or not, what I came to discover, primarily based, to be, based on my background and what I do for a living, is, is that uh, CPS uh, was removing children from the family homes from fit parents uh, simply because they had the discretion to do so. And the more I investigated, the more uh, I was sort of shocked. And so when I when I say shocked, uh, uh, looking from a statistical perspective, I'm, I'm like, well, this can't be happening to me. I'm, this is America, the, you know, what about my parental rights? What about my constitutional rights? What, what about anything that we think that we, we have? Uh, what about due process and, and all of these things that you hear so much about? Well, I wasn't getting any of it and, and uh, I'm trying to understand, you know, why. So uh, I started reading the state statutes. I started reading case law. I started looking at Supreme Court cases, Minnesota Supreme Court cases. Uh, I'm a reader, so I just I was trying to understand this entire process. And the more I came to understand the process, the more I said, this entire system is is broken. It's it's fundamentally flawed. It, it needs to be abolished. Uh, I understand the history and how CPS actually came into existence because I started going back trying to understand how CPS got to its present form. So I, I, I initially went back 20 years looking at all of the reports uh, uh, that are on the federal government website. So anyone can go look at these reports. If, if you go to our, our uh, child welfare statistics page, I actually have links to all of the reports. So I, I first I went back uh, 10 years and I wanted to see, you know, how many children have been removed uh, in, in a 10 year period. And I found out that 5 million children had been, you know, forcibly separated from their parents uh, in, in, in the last 10 years. And I was just like, that seems like a lot. And so then I, I, I went back even further and I said, well, what about the last 20 years? And uh, I found out that uh, about 9.5 million children have been forcibly removed and separated from their parents. And then I started looking at the law and trying to understand, you know, well, why is this happening? How could this happen? Uh, you know, there's, there's no trial. Uh, literally, I, I showed up to court and uh, it's called an EPC hearing, an emergency protective hearing. And there was this railroading process from the very beginning, which, you know, made me feel very uncomfortable. And unlike most parents, I'm not intimidated by the government or, or, or the law. I, I do know, you know, my, my fundamental rights. So um, I was I started challenging the things they were doing uh, from the very beginning. And then, you know, the more I read, I, I was just like, well, they're doing this because the law, their law says they can do it, you know. Right. Uh, and so that's how I got started, you know. Um, had a parental rights group. I started a, a, a Facebook group initially because I, I wanted to see if, if I was the only one that this was happening to because like most uh, comfortable American citizens, and we are at a at a level, uh, you know, that other countries are not. I've, I've been to developing nations. I've, I've worked in Africa for three years, and you know, been down in South America. So we're we're at a level that there's certain things you just don't expect to happen in a, in a civilized society. Uh, and so, when I started looking at the process, I said, I want to find out who else this is happening to. And so my parental rights group, uh, I started hearing the same thing over and over, the same thing. Everyone, so everything I was going through, everyone else was going through. And, you know, and our group 
has grown exponentially. You know, so my association, you know, we started out with a couple of hundred people within a, you know, less than 30 days, we had 500, a thousand, we're up to 12,000 know, members now in our, in our uh, Facebook uh, parental rights group. Uh, and so we're all facing the same thing. Uh, we're, we're a national group. So we're talking to people from Texas. Texas has a hard time. I mean, you, oof. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Texas child welfare system is, is, is a rough one. Yes, um, <laughs> a lot of kids are taken in Texas and a lot of kids are taken in New York. And, you know, uh, I, I looked at a study and I found out that 50% of the half million children that are taken each year come out of five states. And Texas is one of the largest. Texas, California, New York are three of the largest. Uh, so it's, 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 a national, it's a national issue. Um, I found out uh, that Minnesota has, you know, probably the lowest standard out of everyone. So I, you know, I thought Texas was rough, but then I looked at Minnesota and I'm like, well, Minnesota is a, a state where they can take your child strictly based on a rumor, meaning they don't have to prove anything to take your child. They just have to come to come to court and that in a three day period. So they remove the child from the home, their discretion, they come to court and they say, here are the allegations we're going to try and prove your honor. And the judge says, well, if those are in fact true, the child's in need of protection of services. So I'm going to give you 60 days to prove your case, CPS, and I'm going to remand the child to your custody for foster care. And I'm like, well, wait, 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 wait. What, what about I'm, I'm innocent until proven guilty? Well, you're, you're, you're still innocent, Mr. Mitchell, but they get to hold your kids for 60 days and traumatize your kids and bounce them from foster care to foster care before your hearing actually comes up. Wow. Uh, and so that's, you know, how I got involved in this in the first place. That's unbelievable. Because, I mean, I was spanked growing up. And it's what made yeah. me a better man. And I think one of the reasons you're seeing all the riots and the craziness right now is because these kids weren't disciplined. And, I mean, a spanking on the bottom is a spanking on the bottom. Like I said, if more kids got spanked on the bottom right now, we'd have a lot better kids in this world right now. So it's amazing that that would even be an issue. And, I mean, it takes one person, for instance, not liking your something about you, not liking you as a neighbor, not liking your political views, and CPS can be called, and you're saying that they'll take the children before an investigation is done. We, you know, and when I, when I say Minnesota is ground zero, almost everyone in Minnesota went through the exact same thing. And so... Uh, I, I learned the system, and so our, our first case, our first legal case that we took, uh, the Amanda Weber case, they took her, they took her 10-month-old son for supposedly medical neglect. Now, here's the, the part that I found fascinating about the whole Amanda Weber trial that we went through. So I got her son back. Uh, we, there were delays in actually going to trial. But they, they had her son for approximately like 120 days, which was twice wow. as long as they should have had the son. But, you know, and when I say but, there is a Minnesota statute that says if they remove a child, they must have a trial in 60 days or less where the social worker is required to come in and substantiate the allegations with physical evidence before the court. Mm -hmm. And it was every time I looked up, Oh, well, the county attorney's not available. Oh, the guardian ad litem is not available. It, it, it was always this pushing, this pushing of the trial. And, you know, we're sitting here like, Your Honor, it's supposed to happen in 60 days. Find someone else in the county attorney's office. Find, you know, and the judge just gives them all this latitude to do whatever they want. And so I knew the system and I said, okay, we're going to go to your EPC hearing in, in the first three days. And we had two medical reports. So... This all started because Amanda Weber didn't want to vaccinate her youngest child. She, she has three children and her youngest child was having breathing problems. And so her and the doctor were not in agreement. And Amanda was saying, look, you know, I've allowed you to vaccinate my, my other three children. So I'm not against vaccinations. You know, I don't want to vaccinate Xavier until he gets older because, you know, of his breathing. And I just I just I want to wait. And, and her and the uh, the LPM were like, you know, getting into, you know, a heated discussion. And so Amanda said, that, that's fine. 
we can agree to disagree. I, I will no longer be using your services. I'm going to go and uh, uh, find, me, find me someone else, another primary physician. So Amanda took her son to the hospital because she didn't want to go back to the, the doctor, you know, for a cold. And the hospital said, you know, the baby was fine. So uh, after waiting about three hours, she had a 10 month old and a three year old. She wanted to go home and put them to bed. And the doctor was making his rounds and she kept asking, you know, when can I go home? And because they do things on a priority level, you know, at, at hospitals, uh, she kept having to wait and wait. So she says, listen, I want to go and put my children to bed. And they said, okay, here, sign this for me. And you can go stating that you're not going to wait for the, for a second opinion. Like the one doctor wrote it up and said, everything was fine. So when they came and removed her child, social services immediately, oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, let me, let me step back one, I'm sorry. So when she left the hospital, the doctor, the second doctor, who was supposed to check out the child called the primary provider and the primary provider uh, uh, supplied disinformation and said that the child was in imminent risk of dying and called CPS like immediately oh, no. in retaliation for the mother wanting to go to a different doctor. So when we went to court on the very first day, CPS had taken the child and that same day taken to the hospital and did a 24 hour overnight evaluation on the child. And they said, child is fine, nothing's wrong, perfectly healthy, not an emergent situation, everything's fine. We go to court on the very first day. We have two hospital reports, one from Children's Hospital and one from St. Cloud Medical Center. We gave it to the judge and we're like, your honor, there is nothing wrong with the child. There's no medical elect. Here are two doctor reports. This is the one that CPS got two days before they filed a petition to this court to take my child. So they knew that nothing was wrong with the child because they took the child to the to the hospital to get a, a medical uh, examination, 24 hour medical examination. And the judge still allowed them to keep the child in foster care. And I said, well, Your Honor, we're going to we're going to still try and prove medical neglect and that she's not a fit mother and that she's not taking care of her her son. And we're like, we don't we don't understand your, your own doctor that you took him to said he was fine. Right. And it took 120 days to get him back. Wow. So is this was now fast forward, is it your case or is it her case that's going before the Supreme Court? Uh, all right. So what I did is is um, I, I wanted to be uh, I wanted to be effective, meaning when I went to talk to our lawyer, Eric, Eric Cardell, he's, he's a, a top attorney, uh, one of the, the top appellate lawyers in, in Minnesota. Uh, he's uh, argued before the Supreme Court twice and, and been successful. Uh, and uh, he's applied, you know, a n number of times. And so <clears throat> he just won a case actually last week in Wisconsin Supreme Court. So I still have to say this, you know, he's not a schleppy lawyer. So we All were right. talking and I said, you know, I, 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 I don't want this to be just about me. I said, you know, I want to do something for all the parents of Minnesota and the association you know, when I laid everything out for them, I had my discovery. I had 600 pages of documents that proved what CPS did and how they were falsifying information and, and fabricating evidence. And just, you know, they were just brazen and arrogant. And what what what's so interesting when I say brazen and arrogant, they wrote it all down. They wrote down. Yeah. Xander talked talk to me. They said he wanted to go home. And I said, we're not going to let you go home. He talked to us. Psychiatrist called me saying, yes, Zot Xander wants to go home. We're not going to let him go. They're writing all this down that that my son wants to go home and they wouldn't let him come home. That's how brazen and arrogant they are. So when I talked to Eric and I talked to him about our, our association and I said, how do we go about filing a suit? Do we file a class action? Like, like what do we do? And he said, you know, because you, you have a legitimate company and a foundation, I recommend you doing an associational claim. Uh, similar to like what the ACLU and NAACP do. And and so that's the approach we took. Uh, he said, you have to have a person in this suit with, you know, that was actually harmed or damaged, which is you. So you and your family would go on the suit and, you know, in conjunction with the association. So if you look at the petition, it has both our names. It's, you know, Dwight Mitchell and his children and, you know, our parental rights uh, uh, association on 
the complaint, which is, which is on our website also. And so we've been, we've been doing this dance with uh, Minnesota. When I say with Minnesota, uh, even we said, we're not going to go at the state level because we, we know the state level is just horrible and mm -hmm. we're not going to win. He said, but we'll get this straightened out at the federal level. And, and so, you know, we've gone to the district court and we've gone to the appellate court and you know, while we expected the district court to side, you know, with uh, the state, we, we figured the appellate court would straighten it out uh, for the simple fact that it's a 13 judge panel and the judges from different states like, you know, Wisconsin and, and, and uh, uh, Iowa and things of that nature. But we, you know, we gave them a, a 141 page complaint with 84 pages of evidence, physical evidence, you know, CPS documentation that showed what they were doing and it lined up, you know, with our complaint. So we we're like, here's what they did. Here's a document. Here's a, here's a document. And we were just flabbergasted that they uh, uh, supported the lower court's decision. We just, we just knew it was going to get straightened out at that level. And what was even more interesting is that out of our 24 complaints, they only talked about four and the four they mentioned their ruling was all wrong the case law they used was wrong they weren't following the supreme court jurisprudence we was we were sitting here like scratching our heads going like what the heck is going on here so then we filed what's called an, an in bank appeal and what that means is we appeal to the entire eighth circuit we said we want the entire eighth circuit to hear our case you know in totality and then you know come to a ruling and so they, they denied that they published the opinion and basically saying, you got to take this to the Supreme Court. You know, and, you know, we were we were using all the, the case law. We were using the Supreme Court jurisprudence. But we determined that if the Eighth Circuit had actually used the Supreme Court jurisprudence, it would have overridden everything that was done at the lower level. So they're, you know, basically we feel they're telling us, well, the Supreme Court put this jurisprudence in, you go to the Supreme Court and you have them figure it out and tell us what we're doing, you know, is, is incorrect. What's what's fascinating is that uh, other states are, are doing it correctly. So uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, had a CPS case in, um, in March, they ruled on and, and they used the correct jurisprudence and it's, it's a case called uh, Traxel versus Grainville. And in our case, they used a, a police officer case law of, of shock the conscience. And we're like, this isn't a police officer case. And that's that's our main argument. They were using a, a case law that applied to the police and what they did to, to our CPS case. And we're like, that's not what the Supreme Court said. So other circuits are doing it correct way and the Eighth Circuit is not. And so we, we're gonna have to go to the Supreme Court and get it straightened out. Uh, our petition was initially due in um, October because of uh, coronavirus. They pushed everything out two months. So now it's, it's not due until December. So uh, it gives us more time to work on it. Yes, which, <clears throat> may not, which may not be a bad thing at this point because uh, <clears throat> we want a good Congress to be part of this. And the further we can push this thing along, you know, we can vote um, a Congress, which is more likely to take care of this, hopefully. Well, not right. just a Congress, but, uh, you know, a constitutional judge, yeah. an extra one. Yep. Well, you know, it, it's what's, what's, what's uh, interesting about the, um, we were talking earlier about the petition. So mm -hmm. what I what I learned that's uh, running across all 50 states is that uh, there is no constitutional right to be a parent. And I, you know, and I, I tell everybody, I'm like, read the Constitution, read all of the amendments. There's no one in nowhere in there where it says you have a constitutional right to be a parent. Yeah, the 14th Amendment talks about, you know, due process and seizure and, and, and things of that nature. But there's no nothing that's clearly enumerated that says you, you have a right to be a parent, you know, a right to the care, custody and control and upbringing of your child. So this amendment that's before congress right now for this session uh, uh hj res 36 is a parental rights amendment bill and so it's a bipartisan bill 
uh, being worked on by the House and the Senate. They said, you know, here are the six points that we're going to put in the Constitution. So we're going to specifically make an amendment that says this overrules what every state does. Every state has to follow it this way. And parents have a fundamental right to the care, custody, and control of their child. And you, CPS, or anyone else are not allowed to interfere unless there is a significant government interest. No more of this social worker like, I just, I just want to take the child for discretion. And, I, and I'm not anti-CPS because I, I tell everybody there are some children that definitely need to be removed. I mean, yeah. parents call us and we don't, we don't help these parents. We're like, you know, one woman called and she's just like, oh, they just took my baby. You know, we were in the hospital and I tested positive for meth. I'm like, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you. I said, you know, you know, that's a clear, you know, A, doing meth is, is illegal and B, you were doing it when you were pregnant. I said, that's one of these things where you put your child at, at, at risk of death. And I said, we, we, we can't help you. So things of that nature, you know, we, we you know, we'll tell you to go look at our our CPS legal library so you understand your your constitutional rights but we we won't represent you in a situation of that nature so so as far go ahead no so I, I was just trying to, to say so we are um, we're not anti CPS we just think CPS needs to be re-engineered we we want them to stop all of this uh, willy-nilly taking children that are not harmed. What you're going to be surprised to find, which, which I was also, when I started looking at statistics, well, only 6% of the allegations are for sexual assault and 12%, I mean, I'm sorry, 4% of the allegations are for sexual assault. 12% of the allegations that bring the cases in are for physical assault and physical assault is anything that leaves a bruise. You know, and that's in CPS's handbook, and and eighty four percent is is based on neglect, which is strictly social worker discretion, meaning they have the discretion to take any kid they want. And I keep trying to tell the American public, like, don't you realize? I said they're taking a half a million children a year. They've taken five million in ten. They've taken nine million in twenty. And your kids are next unless we stop this now. So. This whole petition is about, you know, getting this bill in front of Congress. I mean, getting Congress to act on it. So when uh, when the uh, the website whitehouse.gov came up, it was a way for we the people to tell Congress what we feel is the most important thing. And, and this is what we want you to work on. So the more votes you get, uh, the, the better. And so that's what we're telling them. We want this parental rights amendment. So the numbers you just gave, what are the numbers for the kids that actually go into foster care? So they're taking away, what, 4% for sexual assault, 12, 14% for physical and then emotional. <clears throat> What's the numbers that happens to these kids in foster care? Well, that, you know, the number that I gave you are the children that are removed and put into foster care. Yeah. So, you know, this, this 5 million and 9 million are, children that were in foster care and you know if you look at our, our, our web page the statistics for foster care in america is horrible i mean it, it's it's a broken system so if you go to our about page and you come halfway down we've actually put together a graph of foster care outcomes and so these foster care outcomes were, were, were not deriving there these are federal statistics and i i cite where where these statistics come from and so uh, 50 percent of the women are pregnant uh, by the age of 18. Uh, 50 percent of the children do not have high school diplomas when they age out of the system. Only five percent of the children go to college that age out of the system at 18. Within one year, oh, uh, at the age of 18, 18 percent of the children are immediately homeless, meaning they, they have nowhere to go. The minute they hit 18. Within one year, 50% of the children that age out are, you know, doing crime or are in jail. In two years, 75% of the children are in jail that were former foster care that aged out of the system. 
and get this, 90% of the people on death row were former foster care wow. children. Wow. I was like, those statistics are horrible. Oh, yeah. You no. Know? And that and, must be horrifying as a parent because, I mean, I was a ruffian when I was a kid. I was always bruised. I always had stitches, but I can promise you it wasn't my mom or my dad that did it. It was me right. being a ruffian. So something as simple as that can get you in, in this whole situation. Oh, yeah. I, I was like you. I was a walking wound. <laughs> so, that's what my mother called me. But it was it was interesting that you should say that because now everyone is a mandatory reporter. And the amount of of calls that are that, that are coming to CPS now are in the millions. And so they screen all these calls and 84% of the calls that are screened in are, are, are they say are not, um, you know, worth investigating. So that's 84%. And of the, of the children they do take in another 84% the allegations are unsubstantiated. I mean, they never come into court with evidence and prove that the allegations were true. And so you you look at that now with the teachers being mandatory reporters, the doctors being mandatory reporters, the woman at Kmart, you know, everyone now is considered a mandatory reporter, the next door neighbor. We had a, <clears throat> we had a, a, a representative, and I, I'm not allowed to mention his name, I, t- I told him I wouldn't, but I, there's a, a representative of Minnesota that confided in me that he even had CPS, uh, uh, come into his house because the wife had the baby in the backyard in the swing. She was on her hands and knees in the garden, which was directly behind the swing. The neighbor didn't see <clears throat> the wife and thought she left the child outside unattended and called CPS. So when the <laughs> wife got the call that CPS was coming over, she called her husband, who was a representative. Her husband said, put the kids in the car and drive to Wisconsin right now, get to the first motel you can get to, and then give me a call when you get there safely. And I, now, so this is a representative from Minnesota telling his wife to leave the state with their child immediately, just outsort it out. And so when CPS came to the house, he was there, he explained what happened, and he said, my wife was here, he walked over, the garden is 10 feet away, she was on her hands and knees, She was she, the child wasn't left alone, you know, that the neighbor called, which was, bizarre. I'm like, you're the neighbor. Why didn't you walk next door and stay with the baby if the baby was alone or go see, you know, go talk to the wife. So his neighbor called. Needless to say, they aren't on good terms oh, anymore. No, no. <laughs> no. But that's, probably, how, that's how simple it is now. Probably opposite party anyway. That I, that I don't know, but you're, <laughs> you may be right. <laughs> so, you know, but, two, two, oh, go ahead. If there's a but. No, no. What I was going to say to you, so uh, say you, um, your, your child is walking out into the street. And I, I know this happened to a parent. So this is a true story. And the, the parent grabbed the child and, and pulled them back quickly, you know, so they wouldn't get hit by a car and left, you know, uh, mm-hmm. hand marks on the, the child's arm. And so uh, uh, the kid went to school and the teacher is just like, you know, what are those marks? You know, oh, my, my mom did it this morning, you know. Uh, and you know when she grabbed me and so the teacher called cps because the mom left imprints on the arm when she was pulling the son back and then cps came into her and started this investigation and she was a bad mother how could she do this and, and she was just like i was saving him he, he, he almost got hit by a car and they they didn't believe her and she had to go through this whole ordeal you know with you know just because she put bruises on his arm while pulling him back out mm-hmm. of the street Wow. So 2017, your group was growing and you started a foundation, your foundation. Can you tell us your mission and, you know, all about it? Sure. Um, the, the, you know, after I, you know, gathered all of this information <clears throat> and it, it was, it was really sort of like a Jonah and the whale thing uh, for you Christians, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, I was, um, I had gotten my kids back now, I got six years ago now. And so um, people ask me, well, why, why are you still, why are you doing this? Like, why, why did you form this foundation? Uh, and I said, well, I didn't initially, I didn't initially do this. So 
what happened is w- once I got my kid back, I immediately left Minnesota. And, you know, I, I have an office there. That's our primary office. And what we're doing while we're fighting, I have a second office in New Jersey. We, we like to take this national. But I, I, I said that um, I, someone needs to help these people. And so, you know, my attorneys and everyone I know said, just try and get on with your life. Pretend it didn't happen. I said, pretend it didn't happen. They took my son. They lied, you know. So I was having a really, really hard time and, and, and I couldn't sleep at night, even though I had all my kids, I should be like happy and content, uh, but but I, I was not. And so uh, I felt that uh, the Lord was calling me to, to, to do this, uh, being that I had my own corporation now uh, that I've had for 27 years. And I know the ins and outs of, of the law and contract law and things that are legal what I ended up doing was uh, starting the nonprofit, the 501c3, with the sole mission of, of initially of, of educating uh, individuals to discuss CPS, to tell them about their their rights as it applies to the laws in the state and how to how to fight and win. Um, and when I say fight and win, you you can win against CPS, but CPS preys on the weak. Uh, they they prey on uh, the, the, the females' emotional content. They prey on these single family households, uh, especially. Uh, but they, they prey on anybody, and they they target their attacks to to the women always. It's it's literally the women that they target because they, the women want to do anything to get those kids back immediately. I want my kids, mm-hmm. and so uh, they'll do whatever CPS tells them to do. And I said, no, that's wrong. I said, that's not the law. So my my sole mission was education. Um, and so when I, I started doing this, uh, people, believe it or not, were having a hard time believing what I was saying. And, and I, you know, whatever I said, it wasn't just, well, this is what Dwight Mitchell thinks. I said, no, here's the statute and here's the case law that goes along with it. So, you know, the first thing I wrote was 35 key tips. To, to know if CPS comes knocking at your door. And that's that's on our website also. And I, I did that video and there's a PDF handout. Actually, every one of our videos has a PDF handout that's associated with it. Uh, and so what ended up happening, how we got into the litigation side of it was that, well, I mean, as I was trying to help educate people, people were constantly uh, like attacking me, you know, and I'm like, okay, you everyone can have their own opinion. You know, some people were like, you know, just cooperate with CPS and you'll eventually get your child back. I said, no, uh, cooperate with CPS and they're going to have your child for a year or more. And so what I had to do is I said, okay, we're going to have to, you know, get into the legal side. And I need someone who's not afraid to fight the government because most lawyers are afraid. They're like, well, I got to go back in front of the judge again. or I have to work this prosecutor or this, this attorney and I have to stay on good terms with everyone. And I'm like, no, 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 no you're supposed to be defending me. So now I'm going to take a case and I'm going to show you exactly how it should be done. So we, we took the Amanda Weber case like pro bono and she was like every single mother that has had their child taken, you know, CPS was hitting her with all these things that they wanted her to comply with. We want you to take a drug test. We want all your, 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 um, your hospital records, your school records, your this, your that. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, the only thing that you're going to sign is a document for visitation. And by law, here's the, here's the law, they have to give you visitation. So they were trying to use the children as blackmail to get her to sign all these other forms. I said, no, we're not. We motioned the court, wrote a motion to the court, sent it in. She started getting visitation immediately with, with her child. So, you know, as we went through uh, this case, you know, Amanda said, but if I don't do what they say, they're going to take my child. I said, well, you, you came to me for advice. You, you, you wanted me to, to help you do this case pro bono. You know, um, I'm not a lawyer, so I had to get a lawyer, but I'm, you know, I can set the guidelines and the standards. I'm like, this is, this is what we're going to do. If you have a problem with that strategy, you know, I'm not trying to violate the, the, the lawyer client privilege, but I'm hiring you to do this and to follow this approach. Um, and so what I showed everyone was that if you made the, 
if you made CPS follow the state law and you didn't agree to anything and you demanded your trial, you got your trial, they couldn't prove that there was any harm to the child. And then ergo, you know, they had to let the child go. And so I, I told a man, I said, you have a choice when we, when we started. And I said, I said, uh, uh, and I'll give you two choices. I said, they can have your children for 60 days till we go to trial because we have all the evidence. I said, we have the medical report, so they can't win. I said, or you can do everything you say and they'll have your child between 12 and 15 months. And at the end, they're going to terminate your parental rights and give away your son. Because she, you know, you know, her son, Xavion, was, he, he's a beautiful little boy, blonde, blue eyed, you know, big eyes. And I'm just, you know, they saw him and said, OK, you know, we get a bonus for every uh, foster care child we get adopted. We'll we'll get him adopted quick and easy, fast. You know, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, the foster family wanted to adopt him. So they actually already had, you know, a family lined up to take Xavion and they were they were doing this dance and we were like, no. And so we, we got the child back. So I proved to everyone. I'm like, this is the way you need to follow it in Minnesota to get your child back. Yes, they're going to have your child for 60 days because that's the law in Minnesota. And I can't get around that. I said that's the judges allow them 60 days or sooner to bring it to trial. But you. You should not cooperate. And people look at me like, oh, well, if you don't cooperate, they're going to retaliate. I'm like, yes, they are. I said, they're going to try everything they can. They're going to be mad at you because you aren't afraid of them. And they use fear, power, and intimidation to try and control the parents. Uh, You know, one of the things in my case, similar to Amanda Weber's case, when I finally got my day in court and I got my my kids back pro se after this long period of time because it took me just so long to finally get my hearing you know i filed you know a motion to dismiss a motion to vacate and a motion for lack of subject matter jurisdiction and when i finally got all that evidence in front of a judge at at, at my hearing the very next hearing cps came in dismissed all the charges and and gave me and your son is sitting out waiting in the lobby and i'm like you kept him all this time and you knew you didn't have subject matter jurisdiction. You knew I was not from Minnesota and had New Jersey, New Jersey custody court order. You fabricated all of this evidence to keep the child. And what really made it so bad with, with my case, it's just like, you know, there was no harm to my child. When I say no harm, they didn't take him to the hospital. They didn't have him checked out. There was, they, they didn't do anything. They just said, we can take him because we can, and they put him in foster care because that's what they wanted to do. So in my case, I learned what to do. I, I finally applied that. So now, you know, I have this, I call it, you know, CPS has a playbook. And I tell everybody, it's, it's the Minnesota CPS playbook. Here's what they're going to do. And I tell people the CPS timeline. I go over that. I'm like, here's what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it. You need to hold them to this timeline. Don't do anything with 60 days. I'm like, here is the law and here's the case law to support it. They cannot order you to do any services or anything for 60 days. Only if they come in and substantiate the allegations with hard evidence can the judge give an order to say, okay, your child is in need of protection or service and now you have to do the CPS service that they tell you to do. So you, you, you know, I can't tell people, you know, when you know, to go against their attorney's uh, wishes or strategy. I say um, <clears throat> that's attorney, you know, client privilege. It's up to you to determine what you want to do. But I have, I actually have two uh, 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 classes or two units, is what I call educational units, on dealing with your lawyer. You know, what to do if you have a private lawyer and what to do if you have a public defender. Uh, and how to make sure that they're doing what they are supposed to do, you know, as it relates to uh, CPS and that they're following the statute. So I, I give the parents, so here's the playbook. Here's what CPS is going to do. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to tell your attorney to do. And your attorney needs to understand you work for me. I don't work for you. You advise me. <clears throat> I have taken an advisement. This is what I want you to do. And, 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 and literally by law, that is what the attorney is supposed to do. But the attorneys are so cocky and arrogant that they try, they even try and badger the parents. 
oh, it's not going to work, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here going like, I, I heard what you said. Let me let me play back what you said. You know, you said this, this, and this. I tell her parents, tell them to show you the state statutes to whatever they're saying and to show you the case law that fits their strategy, their legal strategy. If they can't do that, it's hogwash. And you, you tell them. <laughs> and I also tell everyone, make sure you get everything in writing from everyone, yes. even your own attorney. Everything must be in writing. Great advice. I mean, our, our uh, guests from last week were kind of saying the same thing. You know, make sure there's a warrant. Mm -hmm. Make sure, um, even what you were talking about earlier about the doctor. She was like, never tell one doctor that you're going to get a second opinion from another. Just go right. do it. You know, so there's just right. little hints. And unfortunately, you have to go through this before you can figure it out. So thank goodness there's people like you that are um, helping others become aware of this. We're, we're trying to get out the word. So we literally just, we, uh, we're, we're, we're fortunate that uh, Google just approved us for our, our nonprofit advertising. So you know, Google has given us a donation of $10,000 a month for uh, an advertising cost. So we started doing that campaign. And so we literally, uh, our, our marketing guy today put together uh, a, a Google ad campaign just for the education. I said, I won an ad campaign when someone searches for CPS to Ben, I wanted to land on these five landing pages, you know, All like, right. you know, our legal library, what to do when CPS comes into your life, 35 key tips, your CPS to come knocking at your door. I'm like, I want them to land on these pages and click and come in. And I'm, I'm going to use that $10,000 grant to like disseminate this, you know, across the United States. Uh, and you know, one of the key things I always I always emphasize to any parent that calls me, and, and the reason we were so successful with Amanda Weber is that she called me the, the the second day or the day after they took her child, and she was up all night trying to find like an association. She just happened to get me. I said, I said it was it was the Lord's will. I was actually oh, yes. looking to take that a first case, and I needed to get somebody right out of the gate. And she literally called me on the very next day. And, and before I agreed to work with her, I said, show me the video, you know, because she told me she took video of, of everything that happened. I said, show me the hospital report. I said, OK, I, you know, I can work with you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> you know? don't be afraid to use your telephones for video. That's for sure. That is yeah, evidenced <laughs> immediately. So exactly. we're going to go ahead and we're going to go do weather right now and we're going to come back to Q&A. So, guys, if okay. you want to go ahead and get your questions in the comment area, we will be back with the answers, and we're moving on to weather now. All right, guys, it looks like it has slowed down a little bit as far as the tropical action. Um, we got... The heat's coming back a little bit, definitely in the Los Angeles, California area, and a little bit further south. We have Lowell, which is um, tropical storm right now, and it looks like it should be dissipating probably within the next three or four days. We have Beta, which is finally making its move um, out of Texas, and it's going to be bringing probably six to seven inches of rain into Louisiana, Alabama, and it appears that it's going to exit out to the Carolinas. So... Um, by the time it gets to the coast, you'll probably get about maybe one to two inches of rain out of that. We have Teddy, which is way north right now. Past through Halifax is going to be heading probably out through Nova, Sco Nova Scotia or New Scotland, as I call it. Bring in no more than two to three inches of rain there. Paulette has reformed and it will be dissipating probably within the next two days. Now we have Dolphin, which is off of Osaka and Tokyo and Japan. Going to be dumping probably... Uh, 11 inches off the coast, um, so any boating, I would stay out of the water there. If you're there, um, 5 to 6 inches of rain um, north of Tokyo. Um, this is what we're looking at now. We are down to Beta, Teddy, and the remnants of Paulette. Here's your overview right now of the, what we're looking at. The tropics is calming down. It'll get a little bit busier in the Gulf because it's still 80 degrees, 90 degrees in the water, so expect some there. Um, this is the track right now, um, heading out by Newfoundland and... By the time it gets north to Canada, it's going to be all over the place. And it doesn't look like it's going to be doing anything but turning into a low. Um, by tomorrow, uh, beta will be a low. And it's just going to be a rainmaker from there. So things are clearing up a little bit. And that brings us to Q&A. Thank you, Duncan. Always a lot happening in the weather these days. Yeah, this is the quietest we've had it in a while. I know. Still even a lot. 
Um, well, first and foremost, you know, I feel like I'm getting a minor and a degree on how to handle CPS between Friday's show and, you know, with uh, Rachel Bruno and Megan Fox. And now you, I feel like, you know, you guys have been amazing. I never knew this stuff was really as deep as it was going mm -hmm. on in this organization. Yeah, I'm glad there's people out there either. like you. I, I'm definitely glad that there's people like you out here right now that are fighting back. Yeah, yeah, and bringing it to the attention because, I mean, parents are just generally unaware. And yep. until you get pulled into this situation, you never have a need to look it up. So it's right. great that, that you're getting out there and doing that. And I know that our guests and many other people across all of our platforms are going to do everything they can to get this petition signed and get all this information out there because no one is is out of the hands of being pulled into this. And it's as simple as a neighbor not liking you or a neighbor That's disagreeing right. with politics. So we should be prepared for it. And like I said, I'm thankful that you're doing this. I, I read an article today that the number of cases in CPS have been going up since COVID and mm -hmm. that people are getting a lot more calls. You know, it, you know, if your teachers are seeing marks or bruises or whatever, they said the since school has started, the number of cases have, has, of calls have actually doubled. They said now, I I've understand heard, that also. I've heard of cases where they're taking the kids away if the parents have COVID. Well, they're, they're also taking that, that's true. And they're also taking the kids away for being tardy. So if if the child is not signing in to his Zoom sessions or is late, they're calling CPS on, on that also. Oh so the gosh. parents, they're getting calls from the school like so and so wasn't on Zoom today and, and um, the parent didn't call the school. Go, go check on the child. So they're saying because of this Zoom session now, the person can legitimately be having a problem. Their Internet could be down. They can have mm -hmm. a power failure. The computer could have went down. And so they're getting calls. CPS is getting calls for this now. Oh, and, bad. Uh, Patrick <laughs> Dawes wants to know if you've heard of the organization CASA, C-A-S-A, -A, Court Appointed Special Advocates. And what do you think of this organization? Ooh, put me on the spot right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I know about CASA. Um, I, I've actually talked to a number of, of their representatives. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't worked with CASA, so I'll, I'll put it to you that way. Uh, in my humble opinion, CASA is uh, aligned with the system, this yeah. machine. It's an industrial complex, so CASA is making money, and they're drinking coffee out of the same pot as the prosecutors, the judges, the county attorneys. Uh, the whole foster care system and, and CASA is involved in that. Uh, you know, I, I can't say anything negative about CASA. You know, that, that's, that's not my place. Everyone's going to have to make their own uh, judgment and opinion on, on CASA. I can only say that I've been approached by, by CASA and I, I haven't used this service and I, and I haven't worked with them. Our organization hasn't worked with them. Nice. Do you... Um... Ali for Truth wants to know if you know the, st the stats of CPS intrusion uh, since the uh, pandemic has started. Well, actually, I do. Uh, what, what's interesting is that the number of calls to CPS actually dropped by about 60 percent since the pandemic started. A lot of people thought that it was going to go up, but it, it was the exact opposite. It went down uh, in the last two weeks since school has started, though the number of calls has more than doubled. So they're trying to understand and, you know, this, this shift all of a sudden, they were like, okay, the calls went down, you know, and, and what's really interesting is that a lot of the, a lot of the calls now are coming from the hospitals. And so your know, parents taking their kids in the emergency room or whatever. So now, like myself, who was a walking wound or, or Duncan. Yes. You know, if if they, you take your kid to the hospital because he has a bruise or whatever, and then the doctor's going to ask you, well, how did you get it? And you you know, I don't know. He was playing. They call CPS. And so they said what what's happening now is they would get like one or two cases a month where they would call CPS. And now they're getting like 10 or more cases where they're calling CPS a month. And, we're, and you know, so they're trying to understand that dynamic also. So it's going up and they're trying to, it went down, 
but in the last two or three weeks it started going up and it's more than double yeah speaking of the cups drinking from the same pot of coffee here's a question riley wants to know who cps is accountable to and who investigates them <laughs> i'm laughing because i said the same thing and i said i'm going to go report to them to the ag you know so no actually i, I called the uh the uh the federal ag first and uh because i knew about the federal funding and everything being funded by title four uh title four e social security act funding so i called the federal ag as oversight and they said oh you have to call the state uh, attorney general so then i called the state attorney general and i started complaining and they were like oh well we report to the head of dhs i'm like what yeah uh, i'm like well, who, who watches DHS? That's the attorney general's job. If your job is oversight, how do you, you shouldn't report to any agency. The, the, you know, the office of the attorney general should be sitting on top of every single agency. And I'm like, well, isn't that like, the, you know, given the, the, the fox, the key to the chicken, have, you literally have to do whatever CPS tells you to because you report to the commissioner of DHS. I, so I was flabbergasted. DHS is over the over uh, CPS and they investigate CPS with the, within their own department. That is, that is correct. Wow. And, and, and nothing happens. No, so I, is there an IG that investigates at all? No, that's the, the office of the attorney general is supposed to do that. You can file a complaint. And so when we won the Amanda Weber case, we filed a complaint against a licensed practitioner and, and the, uh, the uh the social worker with the judge's findings and you know what happened to both of them nothing wow they both came back and said there's not enough evidence for us to do anything and i said okay you guys are all working together you're protecting each other it's you know i uh, i understand that and that's why we said we we had to jump you know up to the federal realm and said wow. that we can't work within the state body. Wow, I mean, and they and they even said to go to your state attorney, and, attorney general, and his hands aren't necessarily clean. He's not the guy I'd want to be looking into abuse, especially in Minnesota. Especially in Minnesota, <laughs> exactly. <No. laughs> but you, you know, and most like most people don't understand, and I, I, I had to try and understand the dynamics, and so I'll just point this out quickly. Uh, uh, DHS in every state is one of the like the top four or five agencies in every single state in the union and minnesota is the fourth largest agency as, as far as uh, uh funding? money funding being yeah. spent it's like 19 billion a year or something it's just huge amount of money wow. and uh, they're not like the fourth largest agency so that they, they wield a lot of power so it, you're part of your case this probably answers the question is part of your case in hopes is lf J45 wants to know what it would do to put federal team over investigating CPS instead of them investigating themselves. But part of your hope out of your case before the Supreme Court is to re redo CPS, right? Well, and initially, and it's, it's funny you should say that, <clears throat> our primary goal was to get CPS to uh, the Supreme Court to <clears throat> talk about the Traxel Granville case. So before 2000, you know, parental rights were given deference in the United States. In 2000, a parental rights came before the Supreme Court, and it was a split decision. There were five separate opinions. It's, it's Traxel versus Granville. And what they ended up doing is opening the door for all of the states to do whatever they want, because the Supreme Court couldn't come up with a unanimous decision on how to uh, apply the CPS rules across the board with parental rights. So now that's given CPS in every single state to willy nilly to do whatever they want. And it all comes down to state law and what the state legislature puts into law and what they want to do. Fast forward to the parental rights amendment. <clears throat> so if the parental rights amendment bill gets passed, this non bipartisan bill gets passed. It will now set a standard that says this federal law it supersedes all state law and, and the parents have the right to the care, custody, and control of their child. 
you know, most people don't realize right now that out of, you know, all of the states in the union, only five states have a jury trial for the termination or, or the, the to sever the parent-child relationship. Only, only five. So the other 45 states literally sever or terminate your parental rights with no jury trial, with just CPS saying, we want to we want to terminate your rights. And so this parental rights amendment will stop that, Perfect. you know. <clears throat> and so between our law, you know, what we're trying to do with the Supreme Court is we're trying to get them to reestablish as law, Supreme Court jurisprudence, that parents have a parental right. Because see, right now, it's not a constitutional right. It's all law. And that's that's what's going on. People don't really understand. You know, you have your First Amendment, your Second Amendment, and these, you know, these rights can't be infringed upon. You know, parental rights, though, are at the law level, and all of the courts are making the law with the Supreme Court deciding what parental rights they're going to give you. If we get an amendment to the Constitution, this is like, you can't give me any. The Constitution says I have the right, and you can't come in to, and take my child unless you have evidence that I am you know, well, and when I say evidence, it, it, the that's not the exact wording. Unless the government, you know, has a valid reason for interfering in the parent-child relationship, meaning CPS would still work, but you can't take kids without, you know, without some evidence. And, you know, and you can't just hold a child in foster care for 22 months without having even substantiated any abuse. All of the things that they're doing now, you know. So we're talking about not severing your parental right and not holding your child unless they can substantiate the allegations. In your foundation, you're a 501-3C, right? 501-C3, yes. Yeah. So we're so nonprofit. Do you, uh, how much do you rely on grants? Because donations must be tough getting for, from parents especially, uh, who are fighting the system because all their money is wrapped up in fighting the system. And, and what you said is, is so true, which is why I, I, I put out the free training, because most of the parents, uh, you know, cannot afford training. So when I, I, I did a Freedom of Information uh, inquiry into Minnesota, so I, I wrote the Minnesota Judiciary, and quickly what I found out was just horrifying. So in the last five years, they took 37,000 children and separated them from their families. I said, how many had parent at lawyers at the EPC hearing in three days? That's the emergency protective hearing. Only about a thousand parents had lawyers when their child was stripped. I mean, 36,000 children were taken away. Actually, it took away all 37, but only a thousand had lawyers. I said, well, how many had lawyers at the admit the night, which is two weeks later? That was only 2,600. And I said, well, then how many had lawyers in totality? And there were about 16,000. So I said, so you're telling me that over 50% of the parents went through the entire legal process with no legal representation whatsoever, and they and you didn't have enough public defenders? And they said, yes, that's correct. And then I said, my last question was, well, how many of these cases, these 37,000 cases, went to trial in the 60 days as required by law to prove for the, you know, that the social worker had to substantiate her parental rights? And out of 37,000 cases, only 463 met that standard. And so I, I, I literally just sent those statistics to um, uh, Impact Magazine today because they asked me about it. That used to be the social, the chronicle of social change. So funding and donations is very important to get back to your original question. The parents are, are making donations, but in, in essence, you know, my company as is probably our biggest contributor, nice. <laughs> my own company, because when I we, every grant that we've applied for, they've they've come back and told us that we're we're too new. I'm, I'm like, you know, they said come back in three to five years. So our first year when I applied, everyone denied us, and they said come back in three to five years. So I've been, you know, pretty much carrying the uh, the, the foundation. I you know I'm doing this for free. I've been doing this for three for, for four years. Uh, the donation money we have been receiving has been like, you know, paying for the office, keeping the lights on, the website, the domain, and all those things going. So we, we do get, you know, donations, uh, you know, from people. 
uh, what we're trying to do, we have a fundraiser now. We're trying to raise $50,000 so we can hire a staff attorney. And if we can hire a staff attorney, you know, he has to follow our guidelines. And so just like we won the Amanda Weber case, we want to start doing cases pro bono. We determine that, you know, one staff attorney, because of the way that he spread out these court cases, we can do anywhere between five and seven cases a month, you know, you know rolling the cases, uh, you know, uh, that's with one attorney. Uh, and so we were going to hire our own staff attorney, uh, like, like a legal aid clinic does not there. You know, we, we looked at the going rate in Minnesota and it's about 50 K. So uh, that's, that's, uh, that fundraiser is on our website also. So if somebody wants to sponsor that, you know, we, we can put that money in escrow or whatever and say, that's allocated just for this attorney. And we'll say, Beautiful. that's, that's who you're funding, you know? Nice. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Cause I mean, attorneys aren't cheap. That's for sure. And no. you know, neither is, you know, like you said, even something as simple as keeping domains up and electricity, you know, I mean, that costs money, you know, sadly. Right. And the thing is, is what you're doing is priceless. So right. donations, you know, they're hard to get, you know, they, they come in, um, in large numbers sometimes, and then sometimes they don't, you know, so I know that you appreciate the $10 donations as much as you appreciate the hundred dollar donations. I, I literally you know, have been responding you know, and they're, they're in a queue, but I go and respond. I personally respond to everyone's made donation, whether it's two dollars, five dollars, five hundred. Uh, we were we were fortunate uh, last last month. Someone donated twenty five hundred dollars. Nice. And that is that is the largest donation we've received to date. You know, uh, and, and so it, it really made an impact. And what that allowed us to do was the the ad that we just put together that we, we put up on uh, Google this week for the um for the petition that allowed us to pay for that ad to run and then put nice. that ad together and nice. pay for the advertising for that. good so besides all that what could we do to help your case uh with the supreme court laura b would like to know uh we are currently seeking uh amicus curate briefs and what that an amicus curate means a friend of the court and so what that is is that anyone can actually write a brief uh when I say anyone, anyone can submit a brief to the Supreme Court in favor of the case that we're working on. Uh, the lawyer, you have to have a lawyer write it up because the person has to be, uh, uh, they called inducted or being allowed to present evidence before the Supreme Court. So uh, if anyone has a lawyer who's not you know, licensed to practice for the Supreme Court, we, we can make that happen. We're trying to get people to uh, sign on to like a, a group brief. <clears throat> the more briefs, the more amicus brief, the better, because that tells the Supreme Court, we want you to hear this case and here's the reason why we want you to hear this case. Good. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, Madison brings up a good point. Um, have you, with the election coming up, uh, do you see one way or another of, because uh, I know you're trying to stay uh, bipartisan, uh, do you see one way or another where uh, an election uh, change could happen? You know, a change of house, a change of, of uh, you know, one party over another right now? Uh, as it relates to the, this uh, uh, amendment before yeah. Congress, yes. uh, if, if, that's the, if that's the question, I don't, I don't think so because it's a, it's a bipartisan bill. And when I say bipartisan, uh, it, you know, it's in the House right now. The, the Democrats have the House. The Republicans have the Senate. They're working on this bill together. So it is it's not where, you know, the Democrats are saying one thing and the Republicans are saying another. the bill has actually been put together by both of them. These are the, the six things they want to include in the amendment to the Constitution. It's getting it to the floor to vote. And like anything with Congress, it's the squeaky wheel. Like now it's, it's COVID. And so that's what we're trying to raise with this petition and, and this awareness. If we get 100,000 votes or more within 30 days, uh, uh, signatures within 30 days, it automatically goes to Congress. And they're like, they reached a threshold, you know, we have to start paying attention. And people keep signing. But it, it, it signals to Congress that the people, and, you know, are saying, we want you to bring this bill to the floor and vote on this bill. And so... That's what that's what we're doing, and I don't think the election is going to have an effect on that. Yeah, it right. may. Supreme Court, our Supreme Court case, 
you know, that's kind of hanging out there in limbo. I, I don't, I really don't know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, uh, a lot of you, you know, uh, to be perfectly frank, we were actually counting. We have to get four votes. So four justices have to have to agree to bring the case up. And, and to be quite frank, uh, since uh, uh, Ruth Ginsburg was so liberal and she was all about equal rights and equality, we, we counted her as one of our sure votes, you know, really? to, to bring this up. And, you know, we were, you know, when we heard she passed away, uh, we were like, oh, that's definitely one vote that we, you know, we're not going to get, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, because, you know, uh, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, we're, we're conservative. So, you know, I'm a conservative. My lawyer's a conservative. You know, it, it's it's not um, uh, the Supreme Court couldn't come to an agreement in 2000 and it was the same bench that was there now. Right. So we're sitting here saying, OK, well, we might have a difference because if we have two new justices, we have Kavanaugh and another new justice, you know, that might change the whole makeup of the court and we might get a definitive answer. We might not have, you know, five separate opinions. And it, right. you know, so we really don't know, but we needed we need four votes uh, for them to actually hear the case. So four judges have to say, yes, let's hear this case. You would think that the constitutional judges that uh, this would be something that was be really interesting for them because this is uh, adding an amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it, what it was is, you know, and it was kind of interesting. We're more if we had the amendment, then we don't have to go to the Supreme Court. Right. Because we want if we don't get the, if the bill doesn't get passed. So we're we're in this like catch 22. We're, we're trying to do two things at the same time. So you. Oh, you're, I see. Yeah, you're right. We're coming at it from two yeah. different levels. We're Why? saying, you know, while we're waiting for the bill, we're attacking the law. If the bill goes through and I don't need the law because the Constitution supersedes the law that the judges mm -hmm. make. Yeah. So everything, all of your rights now are coming from the judges. And we're like, no, 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 no. This is a fundamental right. Yes. Every parent has a fundamental right to the care, custody, control, and upbringing of their child. Now, you want to get into my business, that's fine, but you have to do it the right way. No more of this, well, we're just going to take your kid and hold him because we can because our state law says you can. The new, uh, you know, the constitutional amendment is like, no, you can't. There needs to be a compelling interest by the state for you to come take my child now. So that's the difference. Or the Supreme Court saying, no, you can't just take this child and, and hold on to it, all of you states. There has to be a compelling interest. You have to do strict scrutiny. You have to investigate and prove with evidence that this child is in need of protection or custody or has been abused. No more of this taking the child and holding them for as long as you want without supplying evidence. It's almost like the criminal side, uh, uh, you know, bringing that into alignment because the civil side is so far out of a line with the, the criminal side right now. So everything you have to do uh, in the criminal side, you don't have to do on the civil side. Uh, a thief could steal a loaf of bread and that thief has more rights and the, and the right to a jury trial, Miranda rights, you know, the Brady law, which is discovery evidence sharing for stealing a loaf of bread. And they can come in and serve your parental rights take your child forever without a jury trial, without providing you any evidence, with, without, you know, it, it's just, it's bizarre that it's going on. And um, I, I think what they've done when I, when I was talking earlier about the numbers and why for 20 years, it's been at that 500,000 threshold. I think they've determined that between 450 and 500,000 keeps this just below the radar. And so the masses don't, don't understand it. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. I went 52 years and didn't know any of this was happening, you know? And, and so I'm sitting here with a megaphone now trying to shout it out mm -hmm. to all your parents that don't know. I'm like, listen, you know, they're taking kids now for, for things that was unheard of 20 years ago when we were growing up. I mean, right. all of our parents would have been. In, in, oh, uh, yes. Yeah. You know, all of the kids would have been gone, mm -hmm. you know, 20 years ago. Well, I sure do appreciate your time. Um, and I'm overwhelmed with everything I've learned oh, between Friday and this show. And uh, 
I can empathize. You know, my wife, um, before we met, uh, you know, went through some things with CPS. And uh, now I see she wasn't, you know, the only one because things that we were crying about uh, actually was happening to a lot of people. And uh, it's, uh, it's tugged on my heart these last two shows that we've talked about this and um and i'm sure it's tugged on her so i appreciate your time i want to thank everybody in chat for um all their questions and participation and i want to thank the moderators for all that they do thank you for having me we just we just want to help and and that's what I, i tell everyone you know i'm like guys i'm not getting paid for it i have no financial incentive I've been doing this. I've been fighting CPS for six years now. I've had the foundation for three. Everything I give you is free. I'm like, just please read it. Look at the video. Let me let me help you so you don't go through what what I went through and what some of these other parents have gone through. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Like I said, these are just things that you don't think about. But this one great thing about what you're doing is it is bipartisan. I mean, whether you're Democrat, whether you're Republican, this can come back and bite you in the butt when you least expect it. So this is something that we can all be on board with because, you know, no matter who you are, or what party you are, you've got children. You love your right, children correct. and you want to keep your children safe. And we know how they are in our own hands, but we can't promise how they are once they get to, to CPS. Our last one of our last guests said that her child got vaccinated while it was taken right. away. And, right. you know, we, we need to do something to control it. And one thing I did not realize is we don't have right parental rights to our children. And Correct. this is something that needs to get out. It needs to be an amendment. It needs to be part of the Constitution um, so that we can fix this going forward. And then maybe even getting somebody else that stands over CPS that keeps an eye on them, like a separate organization. Because when everyone's drinking out of the same cup, when, every, when people can profit off of something like that, there's incentive. And we need to remove that incentive so that, you know, this doesn't happen to people just because someone doesn't like you. And any body cams also, just like the police. Everything should be recorded. Absolutely. And I tell the parents, r- record everything. Yeah, we've got you know, phones now. So, I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't, if it's innocent or not. Get that phone out. Hit record. You can always erase the footage if you don't need it, but you have it if you do. So, if your kid falls, you need to, like, if you're at the park or the playground, take a picture, take a video, you know, just in case he goes to school and the teacher calls CPS and you're like, yeah, he fell off the monkey bars. Here's a picture of it. Mm-hmm. You know, you really have to protect yourself now because the teachers and the doctors, they're all mandatory reporters. And so the teachers like we don't we don't want to do it, but we have to do it. If if we don't report it, then we'll get in trouble, you know, because it's a state law it's yep. called mandatory reporting. Well, I want to thank you again. Um, you've enlightened me. You've enlightened everyone who watched the show tonight. Um, we wish you the best. And we're going to do our part in getting the petition out so that people can start signing it and. Like I said, you keep in touch with us. Let us know how things are going. Um, if you have any advertising or anything like that, we'll get it on our show. We'll push it out. Because, Super. like I said, this yeah. is something that we can all agree on. And it's something that's going to be beneficial to our country and everybody in the long run. But I want to thank you again for joining us. I want to thank everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you for your, cres- your questions and participation. Um, we have another great guest coming up on Friday. So please join us for that. Um, And we will see you guys on Friday. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. Thank you.